Hey, this is Ryan Johnson of Ryan Johnson Ministries. I want to come to you with a word of encouragement. Hopefully it will strengthen you and remind you that what you're doing is very important and why that is important. Some years ago, I was in the nation of Chile. Now, I say Chile. I know it's Chile or others would even pronounce it a different way. But for me, it's Chile, okay, in South America. I'd been there multiple times doing uh, missionary work and ministering at different churches in different regions and such. And it is a country that uh, is beautiful. It's unique. It's If you look on the map, it's that long, narrow country in South America. Uh, the people there are wonderful. But there is some definitely some unique culture aspects to what is happening in that nation. When you go there, at one time, it was a very thriving economy. They've suffered some losses since then. But when you go out into the region stuff, you can definitely see the impact of Catholicism. Uh, a lot of Catholic churches, some, especially in Santiago, are huge. They're beautiful. Um, <clears throat> but you get out into the more rural areas of Chile, and you'll find you know, a typical Catholic church, what you would come to think of or believe in that region, even still beautiful in its way. And one of the things that you'll find out when you're in that nation is it doesn't surprise you to find how many churches there are. Uh, there's Pentecostal, Charismatic, there are even Baptist churches there in the nation. Of course, again, you see a lot of the Catholic churches. But one of the things that would surprise you if you've never been there is the influence of witchcraft. Now, I'm not talking about heebie-jeebie witchcraft that you possibly can or cannot see. I'm talking about actual, genuine, practicing witchcraft. Witches and warlocks. Real deal, witches and warlocks. Not what you'd see in the movies, but where individuals actually go to school and learn how to be a witch or a warlock. Matter of fact... The largest attending what we what we call university college um, in that nation is witches and warlocks, and then the Catholic universities and such. There are more witches and warlocks than there are actually pastors in the land. It's hard for you and I to imagine, hard for us to wrap our thoughts and process around. I'll be honest, as an American out of the United States, when you go into this and you see this, it, it, it's like, this doesn't even sound right, doesn't even seem real. But you, you get a little bit of an understanding the longer you be there. Matter of fact, the host home where I stayed in my time there, up on the side of a mountain, there is a, an altar there. And these witches would gather and they would sacrifice whatever they were sacrificing and they would cast spells on the house in which I was staying in now they'd done this for two reasons one is the pastor that lived there they were casting spells for him and they would do it when I was there and they were casting spells towards me and and when you see this it, it go you go okay wow this is something totally different um, and surreal Matter of fact, what the witches and warlocks do in that region is they assign a witch or a warlock to a pastor. And that witch or warlock would follow the pastor around in his day-to-day -day travels. For example, if you had a pastor that was going to the bank, <clears throat> that pastor could be in the bank and turn around and there's their assigned witch. And what that witch is doing is constantly just cursing them. And, you know, they could go to the restaurant, there where they would be, whatever the case is, the grocery store. And you look at this, and, and us as Americans, we go, I would not even put up with that. It's a huge problem in the nation. But the reality of it hits you on a couple of levels. When I was there, one particular time, what the witches and warlocks do is they set their eyes on a particular church in order to see it closed. They have a very high success rate in seeing these churches closed. And what they do is they take red paint and they paint 
an upside down cross and a circle over it. And that's how they mark that church as going to be closed. We're seeing it closed. And their success rate is astronomical. And so this one particular time I'm in the nation, I, I, where I'm staying at the house home, it's a two-story home, and it's just like a loft upstairs where I was staying, very private, secluded. And I come downstairs, and the host pastor is at the table comforting another pastor, and this pastor is just weeping, boo-hooing. And uh, I said, what's going on? And that pastor said, the host pastor said to me, he said, his church has just been marked by the witches. And I said, what do you mean? That's when he told me about the upside down cross and the, you know, the red paint in the circle. And he said, do you have any advice for this pastor? And I didn't even hesitate. I said, yeah. Tell him to get some white paint and paint over it. And the host pastor, you know, took offense to that. Uh, his, his reason was, he said, you Americans, you, you, you always, you know, you just always, you, you don't think about what we're going through. You just always just rattle stuff off. And I, I honestly, I could understand what he was saying to a degree, but I couldn't understand what he was saying to a degree. And so it started to weigh with me. And I was like, the tolerance of these witches and warlocks is just unreal to me. So we came to this small town. And we were meeting in a pastor's home with other pastors in that region. And the home, I don't know, there was probably 20 other pastors there. They all speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish at all, so everything has to be through my interpreter. And one of the pastors finally speaks up in this, this town that we were at. And they say, oh, we wish that you had been here or that you had arrived uh, two days earlier. And I said, why is that? And they said, two days ago in the park there in the town, the, the, a lot of those towns in, in, in Chile, they, there's a park in the center of the town. And um, they said the witches had a sacrifice. And I said, oh, yeah? And they said, yeah. They sacrificed a three-day-old baby. My mind just, I, I, I couldn't wrap. What do you mean they sacrificed a three day old baby? And they proceeded to tell me that they took a live baby, three years old, and they burned it alive there in the town. And I said, What did you do? And one of the pastors spoke up and said, What do you mean, what did we do? They have so much power. I was enraged. I'm, gonna, I'm, be, I'm just being honest. I was so mad because I'm thinking, what are you doing allowing this to happen? And we have to understand because when he said they have so much power, it really genuinely is true. The culture in that part of the world, the witches and warlocks have redefined the culture. And they're very prominent. They're very powerful. Of course, this is a dark power. We know that. But I'm just enraged with it. And I'm, I'm just like, oh, God, I can't believe they would allow this to happen. These are men of God, you know. And I'm, I'm talking to, even to my host pastor. And he said, you got you to gotta keep something in mind. And I said, what is that? And he goes, there's two main voices that come out of this region. One is the witches and warlocks. Two is Catholicism. Now, I'm not beating Catholicism and in, in degrading it in a in, in moral way. But what I'm saying is this. What Catholicism teaches is you can't do anything without going through a priest. There's nothing that you can do. So you have to understand a culture raises people up believing that they cannot do anything without a priest. So even if you come out of Catholicism and you convert to Christianity and you have a pastor, it's, it's very easy for you to say, I still can't do anything without the pastor. 
But even more, the pastor himself, who's always heard, you can't do anything. And then you have the witches and warlocks and the culture that they create and so on and so forth. So you have a people that have been told that there's nothing that they can do. You have people that have been told that they don't have power, that the witches and warlocks have the power and so on and so forth. So I fly out of the country. I'm in Miami, Florida. I'm on my first part of the leg and I'm having breakfast at a, a restaurant and I'm sitting there by myself and I'm still just hung up over what is happening over this. How can, how can they feel so powerless? How can they feel so helpless? Do they not know who they are in Christ? Do they not know that they are the sons of God, that they can exercise their faith and demonstrate the goodness and the power of the kingdom of God? Do they not know these things? And then I said this, sitting at the airport. I said to the Lord, well, at least we don't sacrifice babies over here. And at least we don't have a bunch of witches doing it. And Holy Spirit knocked me upside the back of the head and he said, no, you call them doctors. Mm. I started weeping right there in the restaurant sitting beside myself. The waitress came over. Are you okay, sir? Is everything okay? It's going to be okay. And I'm like, yeah, I just need a minute by myself. I asked the Lord, what do we do? How, how, do we, how do we shift this? How do we change this? How do we expound from this? How do we move from this? How do we, what do we do? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, change the culture. <laughs> what does that even mean? What does that even look like? How do you change culture? And the Lord took me to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, there's a, a relatively well-known story that we read in the Bible. And a lot of people have read it, but we're going to break it down a little bit more and kind of go into this and get a, an understanding of what it means to change culture. John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, After these things there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for thirty-eight years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Immediately, the man became well, picked up his mat, and began to walk. Now, it was the Sabbath on that day, so the Jews were saying to the man who was cursed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your mat. But he answered to them, Who who made me well was the one who said, Pick up your mat and walk. And they asked him, Who is this man who said, Pick up your mat and walk? But the man who was healed did not know it was who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while the crowd was in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. So do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told that the Jews, Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, "My Father is working unto now, and I myself am working." A very familiar passage of Scripture. A lot of people have read over time or heard in sermons or Sunday school. The man that is healed at the pool of Bethesda. A lot of people use this as an argument that God doesn't heal everyone. And, you know, there's a lot of understandings and misunderstandings applied to the scripture and so on and so forth. Let me just go ahead and say this. 
I, I don't look at this scripture to say that God doesn't heal everyone. I look at this scripture to say it only takes one to change the culture. It only takes one to change the culture. Here's what I mean. Let's look at this. The Pool of Bethesda. There's five porches near the sheep gate. Sheep gate is the gate in which was the sacrifice. The sheep are going to be sacrificed in this process. So it's not an immaculate place by no means, but let's imagine the scene if we will. There's a lot of pools, our, our big pool there, and there's a lot of people there gathered around it. Now, the Bible says that they were sick, they were blind, they were lame, and they were withered. And you have this individual, a man who had been ill for 38 years. Now, what that word right there actually means, if you were to research it and study it out, is the man was sick, but he wasn't paralyzed, he wasn't crippled, he wasn't immovable. The best way I can explain this is, have you ever been so sick that all you wanted to do was lay down? You just wanted to lay there. You didn't want to move. You didn't want to, I mean, you were just, you were that sick and you just had to be at that place where you just laid on the couch or laid in the bed. If you had to get up, you would have got up, but you weren't looking to move. That's what we can understand this type of sickness that this man had. Now, Jesus comes up to him and says, do you want to be made well? That's an interesting question because what sick person wouldn't want to be made well? What lame person, what blind person, what withered person wouldn't want to be made well? But the truth is we all know those individuals. There are some people that do not want to be made well. They have no desire to actually be made whole. There's people that enjoy being sick. It's sad. It's a reality. I had a relative that was a hypochondriac to the highest degree of being a hypochondriac. If your back was hurt, they were having back surgery by the end of the week. If you were sick, they had it 10 times worse. They just, they thrived on being sick. They loved it. Misery loves company. And every disease and infection was their company. They just, they weren't happy unless they were miserable. So you have this individual, and that, that may be why Jesus asked him ultimately, do you want to be made well, is whether or not the guy actually wants to be made well. After all, he's not paralyzed. Which means he could have got to the water if he really, really wanted to. 38 years of being there. Can you imagine, even if I took a half a roll a year and just rolled my body, I could at least make the attempt to try to get there quicker than what he was getting there. But that wasn't the case. That's not what was happening. Someone else, as he would say, would beat him to the water. So it's an interesting question that Jesus says, do you want to be made well? Because by all intents and purposes, it doesn't look like he wants to be made well. But then Jesus tells this man, take up your mat and walk. Now, everyone else up to that time was made whole when the angel stirred the water, first one in. That's what it said, right? First one in the water is made whole. Jesus doesn't put this man in the water. Jesus doesn't take the water and pour it on the man. Jesus doesn't even stir the water. And there is no angel stirring the water. Jesus simply looks at the man and says, Take up your mat and walk. And the scripture says, Immediately, he takes up his mat and he walks. What was the reaction of, of the multitude around the pool. Can you imagine what people were saying? Whoa, 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 whoa. How, 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 does, how does he get up to walk? How, how does he get to be able to walk? He didn't go to the water. There was no angel. How did, no, 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 no. This ain't fair. This ain't right. Can you imagine what was going on in that moment? How did this happen to begin with? Well, let's go back and let's understand the culture. I've been to the Pool of Bethesda. Personally, I've been there. I uh, was in Israel in 2010, 2011, 
And um, I've been to this spot. I've been where the sheep gate was. I've been where they would have been in that moment. The multitude of sick, the lame, the blind, all gathered around the pool. It's a real place. But let's look at something that John writes here in chapter 5. In verse 3, it says, In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered. And then all of a sudden, we get this understanding. In a lot of translations, it will have a parenthesis or maybe a bracket around the following words. Waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season into the pool and stirred up the water, Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease which was afflicted. Now in your Bible, that may have been put in a parenthesis or that block, you know, parenthesis there. Why is that? Well, first of all, when you go to translate the meaning of these words, you'll find out that there are no translations. The words cannot be defined in its actual original text because what this is is an inserting of John talking about the history of the culture. He's given you an understanding of what was believed to be occurring in that moment. So you had this group of people that were around the pool of Bethesda and the culture said that an angel came down and stirred the water. And the first one in the water was to be healed. That's what the culture said. That's what the culture defined. And so all these sick, blind, and lame people are waiting for the stirring of the waters. Now, whether or not someone saw an actual angel, I don't know. I don't know how it got started. But this is an an inserting of words that John puts here, John who wrote the book of John, to give us an understanding of what was taking place in a cultural standpoint. Now, here's, here's a couple of realities. Number one, probably was never an angel stirring the water. Maybe the wind blowing. Well, Ryan, how dare you say something like that? Because this is this is in the book of John. Is it not in this process? Well, let's think about something for a minute. Does God ever contradict himself? No, he can't. If he contradicted himself, then it'd be a lie what he said, right? So there's no contradiction to those things. So what's going on here? What is the process that is taking place? Well, let's think about this just for a moment, okay? The angel stirs the water and first one in gets healed. No one else does, right? Wait a minute. What did Jesus say that God's that that, that that if you want to be first, be last. If you want to be the greatest, be the least. So if the kingdom, understanding God and how this is, if you want to be first, be last, this is God's standard to be first, be last, or to be the greatest, be the least then why in the world would there ever be something that God put into order, first one in, no one else? See, the first thing that you and I have to recognize is, this is not how God operates. God would not put in something into existence and say, first one in, and everybody else gets left out. How do we know this? Again, if you want to be first, be last. If you want to be great, be the least. We know how God is according to His Word, whereas we recognize that this would be a cultural mindset. Whatever stirred the water, they believe that the first one in got healed. I don't know how that worked, but nevertheless, it became the culture. How do we know that? There were a multitude of people gathered around the pool. But let's just say, for the sake of saying, that there was an angel that came and stirred the water. For the sake of argument, let's just say that this angel did come down, stir the water, and when the angel stirred, first one got healed. 
Okay. When Jesus arrives on the scene and he tells the man to pick up his mat and walk and there is no stirring in the water, Jesus just put an angel out of business because there was no need for the angel. All Jesus had to do was speak the word. That's it. That's all he had to do. Speak the word, and he was made whole. So he put the angel out of business. Now, if you don't believe that this was just a wrong culture, or if you believe that this is an angel stirring it, regardless, both cases, Jesus immediately changed the culture. Whether it was just a wrong mindset or whether there was really an angel, Jesus changed the culture. How do I know that? There's no longer anyone at the pool of Bethesda. None. There's nobody there. I've been there. Matter of fact, there's no water at the pool of Bethesda. It's dry. There's rocks and there's some weeds and some grass. There's no water. In one moment of Jesus telling this paralyzed, this paralyzed, sorry, this man, this ill man that take up your mat and walk, he, Jesus, immediately changed the culture around that moment. It's not that God only heals a select few. It's a reality that it only takes one to change the culture. Now, some of us could be sitting here thinking, now, Ryan, that's easy. That's Jesus. You know, that's just Jesus, and that's the way he operates because we have this tendency to kind of write off what we're called to do and what we're called to be because uh, we said in a way that, you know, um, where <laughs> that's just Jesus, and I'm not Jesus. I'm just human. That's one of my, that's one of my things that I laugh at. I love to hear people say, I'm just human. I'm not perfect. I'm only human. You ever heard somebody say that? You ever seen those bumper stickers? I'm not human. I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm only human. Here's the funny thing about it. The word hue, man, the word human, is a 16th century Latin word. H-U-E-M-A man. M-A-N. Hue, man. Well, that Latin word, hue, man, actually means perfect. So when people say, I'm not perfect and I'm only human, they're really saying, I'm not perfect because I'm only perfect. <laughs> I want to tell you something. Here's the reality. I, I don't believe that God created humans. I believe that God created mankind. Stay with me just for a minute. Mankind made in his image and his likeness. The problem with seeing yourself as human is you will try to humanize everything and put everyone on the same level. And the truth of the matter is, it's not necessarily that way. We're equal, but we don't have the same responsibilities. We don't have the same uh, purpose in that, in that manner. Males do not give birth. Females do. Males are the head of the house. Females are not. These are things that are, uh, that are instructed by God. We understand these things. To be, although we are uh, mankind, we're not to be humanized in things. You're created in the image and likeness of God, the Father, Christ the Son, and Holy Spirit. In understanding that you are mankind, you recognize that there is something significantly different about you. You are made different. How? Well, you're made in His image and likeness, but you're also a carrier of His presence. You're a temple, not made with human hands. You host the presence of God. You have Christ within you. You are dual citizens. You're on this, this planet right now, but you're also seated at the right hand of the Father it, with Christ. That's what the Scripture says. Paul said Christ is seated there. We too are there in that heavenly seat. So you understand that there is something different about you. Yes, you're a peculiar people, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. It's not that you're just human. It's that you are different for a purpose. So in understanding that difference, it's not just looking at John chapter 5 and saying, well, that was just Jesus and 
That's just Jesus being good enough. I'm not called to do those things. Go with me to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. We're going to see that many things that Jesus did, He did it so that we would also do those things. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms for those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began to ask to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his glazed on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Walk And seizing him up by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all of the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Acts chapter 3 is the exact thing that happened in John chapter 5. The only difference is it's a gate a little further down the road, but still at the temple. And Jesus didn't pick up the man by hand, and Peter does pick him up. Nevertheless, Jesus simply spoke into the man, and Simon Peter spoke into the man. I'm saying all these things because there's a lot of times that we feel like the culture that we live in, and because it's been that way for so long, that we're incapable of really doing anything about it. We feel like we can't make that predominant shift. But here's the reality. The culture didn't become what it was overnight. The culture began to begin to take on the characteristics of what was being portrayed in that moment. I believe that you have a purpose and a destiny over your life to change the culture in which you live or which you impact the most, the region that you're involved in. You have an opportunity to really establish the kingdom of God, to be light in the midst of darkness. For a city set on the hill, not to shine its light and cover it with a bushel, but to actually shine its light in a way and that it can advance the kingdom of God. But you have to be willing and determine whether or not you're going to shift that kingdom. What? Shift that kingdom? (gasps) See? Here's the reality. Will you shift the kingdom of heaven into the earth? Will you shift the kingdom of heaven into the earth, into your region? And it only takes one to begin the process. I'm sure that the pool of Bethesda didn't empty overnight. Probably over a period of time, people began to realize that nothing's happening here anymore for the things that which Jesus is saying. And possibly some people left and followed Jesus. We don't know that to be 100% sure, but maybe possibly. What if that began to take place in your region, in your community? I know that a lot of you, you're doing things and you're helping people. You're going to rescue them in their time of need, whether it's tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, famine, whatever the case may be. And a lot of times you think, man, I'm just going in and I'm going out. But you have an opportunity to help change the culture. You have an opportunity to be like, to be like Christ. He went into the place at the pool of Bethesda and he simply talked to a man. Do you want to be made well? Then he spoke the possibility to him. Learn to speak life even in the most difficult situations that these individuals are needing in that moment. Learn to be able to shift the culture, to be able to do what is necessary to help people. 
When you do these things, you will establish the kingdom. One of the things that we say is kingdom is family. But you'll never see other individuals as family as long as you view the culture to be more important than family. Which means, as long as you view your culture to be more important than the kingdom. Kingdom is family. White, black, brown, Asian, whatever the case may be. Doesn't matter. The kingdom is family. But if your culture means more to you, you will never see one another as family. You can change the culture where you're at. Keep doing what you're doing. But go with a purpose to help people and to tell them what is possible. And know that we sincerely thank you for your work, your devotion, and your ability to help enlarge and equip the kingdom of God. Guys, we love you, and we honor you, and we bless you in the name of Jesus.